This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. What is going on, everyone? This is episode number 46 of the Homestead Journey Journey Podcast. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Once again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the Homestead Journey. I do greatly appreciate it. Let's jump right into it this week and head right on over to this week's Homestead Happening. There's a lot of things that I want to cover And so let's jump right into it. As you can imagine, here in upstate New York, this time of the year, everything is all about the garden. Garden, garden, garden. Well, I shouldn't say everything. There's a few other things we're going to talk about. But the vast majority of our time, this time of year, here at least in our area, is really dedicated to the garden. This is just really the peak of our our harvesting time. And so right now we have things coming on fast and furious in the garden. Uh, In particular, I have tomatoes just coming on like gangbusters. And so this week um, I did spend a lot of time in the kitchen canning tomatoes, dehydrating tomatoes, And also, I tried a new recipe this year, uh, something called red hot sauce that uh, I found in my ball canning book. And it incorporates tomatoes and hot peppers and actually pickling spices. And it really, really made a very... Now, it's called red hot sauce. I imagine if you were to use, you know, like a scorpion or a, you know, a habanero or, and only those kinds of peppers, it would live up to its name. But I used a variety, a mixture of peppers from our garden. I used everything from jalapenos to, uh, I actually did throw in a couple of habaneros. Uh, Actually, they're, they're Caribbean red hots to be precise, um, I put in some volcanoes, uh, some mariachis, some, uh, I'm trying to remember what else, Uncle Jim's, I believe. It was just a nice variety of of uh, hot peppers. And then in combination with the tomatoes, uh, the vinegar, the sugar, and that pickling spice, it really made a very, very nice sauce. It's got a nice heat to it, but a sweetness to it. And I think it's going to be awesome on hot dogs. So anyhow, I made that this week. I think that's going to be something that I will make, if not every year, maybe every other year, but definitely a keeper of a recipe. Now, I also made uh, some lacto-fermented sauerkraut, or actually started the process this week. And if you follow us on Instagram or Facebook, you will have seen pictures actually to the beginnings of the red hot sauce uh, process as well as making the sauerkraut. Actually, I think it was the end result of the sauerkraut, the sauerkraut in the mason jars. Um, but uh, if you don't follow us on Facebook or Instagram, definitely do that. You can find the links in the show notes and that will keep you up to date with what we have going on here on the homestead all week long. I do try to post pictures of the things that we are doing here. And if you have any kind of questions Uh, I would definitely be glad to answer them. I try to be very quick in my responses on those two platforms. And so hopefully maybe through that I can spark your interest and uh, maybe there'll be something that I'm trying that you'll be interested in. There was a lot of people who reached out to me a couple of weeks ago for the recipe for the zucchini relish. And I am certainly happy to pass those things on. I just try not to, when I'm doing them out of a a cookbook like the Bob um, canning book that I have, I try not to post the entire recipe uh, out on on the internet just because of copyright concerns. Uh, But if you do contact me, I am more than happy to share those things with you. 
Anyhow, we also, as I said earlier, I, I did some more dehydrating. That dehydrator has probably run almost nonstop uh, the last couple of weeks. And I uh, did more tomatoes, more peppers, and uh, I've got more tomato skins in there that I will grind up into tomato flakes, tomato powder. We'll see if we like it. But uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained. That's certainly been going on this week as well. Now, this week, my son actually was gone uh, the better half of the week, the later part of the week, on a Boy Scout camping trip. And I actually was supposed to go on that trip as well. I'm the scoutmaster for his troop. But uh, due to some life circumstances, I ended up staying home. And so while he was gone... Obviously, that means that his chores become our chores, or rather, they become my wife's chores, if I'm being honest and frank. But uh, it certainly does create a bit of a, a hole here on the homestead. Things that we are used to him doing, we are now having to do. And right now, one of those things is getting the turkeys out of the tree at nighttime. We have two or three of those knuckleheads. We have six total right now. Uh, two or three of them that just like to fly up in the tree and roost at night. And I probably could just let them be and they would be okay. But I don't like to do that. And so that means every night <clears throat> I have to climb up on top of their coop and uh, try to pull them down out of that tree. And uh, so one of the things my son has started doing is he will try to get them penned up earlier in the evening and that way they don't fly up into the tree. But I'm not quite that smart and so <laughs> I found myself pulling some turkeys out of the tree this week. Another thing you would have seen uh, if you follow us on Facebook and Instagram is that I built some new sides for our utility trailer so that we can use our utility trailer to transport our pigs. Now, I had some sides that I built a, a number of years ago utilizing just some 2x4s, some regular 2x4s, and some, it was kind of scrap pieces of 2x4 uh, field fencing and welded wire fencing, I guess is technically what it's called. And just over time, that pine gave up the ghost and it fell apart on me. <laughs> and so I uh, needed to pick up a pig this weekend. And so utilizing some cattle panels and some uh, pressure treated lumber, I built some sides for the utility trailer. Now, it didn't come out exactly like I wanted it to. There's some tweaks that I know I'm going to need to make to it. But overall, I was I was happy with it. And, um, you know, we'll keep improving on the design, but uh, it, it definitely did work well for its intended purpose. And what I had to do yesterday, and this is why it really ended up working out well for me not to go on that camping trip with my son, is I had someone who purchased a pig from me earlier this year who kind of had second thoughts about it. Um, she wasn't used to having uh, a, a sow with piglets. And uh, in the past, she's only ever raised feeder pigs. And her background is actually with goats. And you can do things with the with goat kids in front of a, a doe that uh, you cannot do with piglets in front of a sow. And um, unfortunately, what happened is she noticed there was a piglet that had some um, feces on it. And uh, so trying to do well by the animal. She went into the pen and picked the, the, uh, the piglet up and, and, and flipped it over. And of course the piglet squealed and uh, that caused the mama to charge. And that just created in her a fear of the sow um, that just, she felt more comfortable um, taking it off of her, off of her farm. And so I, I was certainly, um, you know, I don't want to say I was glad to do it because obviously, you know, I'm having to refund money. It's another animal. It's more mouths to feed. But I definitely, A, want to do right by the animal and B, I want to do right by by people who buy from me. Um, and so I had to uh, go about two and a half hours one way yesterday to pick up that pig. 
um, the lady who purchased it from me unfortunately had been rear-ended and so the truck that she normally could have transported the animal with um, was unavailable. And so my wife and I drove about two and a half hours up to get that pig yesterday and uh, so we decided to make a day of it. This was up uh, in a part of Vermont that we have not been to and uh, so we actually went up and uh, tooled around in Montpelier, Vermont, which was a very, very cool town. Uh, very bizarre that a town like that is actually a state capital. And uh, if you've never visited Montpelier, Vermont, then you will understand. I, I'm used to a state capital being like Albany, New York, um, which is kind of, I mean, it's not like New York City, but it's still a bustling, very urban area. And uh, Montpelier, Vermont, is, it just kind of felt like um, I, I don't know. It, it was, it kind of had more of a small town vibe to it, I guess. But anyhow, so we went up and spent some time tooling around there and, and just, uh, went to a, a maple farm and went to a cider mill and, uh, and then we picked up the pig and brought her home and she actually loaded very, very easily for me. I was very happy about that. Uh, she unloaded very easily and I, I wanted to keep an eye on the pig just to make sure if she is an aggressive sow, certainly I'm not going to breed her again. And I would not um, want to utilize her offspring as breeders either because I definitely don't want to pass those traits on. But uh, from what I've observed over the last uh, you know day and a half here is that uh, she does not seem to be overly aggressive. I think what happened is she was simply being protective of her piglet and it was confused um, by, by this lady who just had no background whatsoever with pigs in, into uh, the, the pig itself being aggressive. And I get it. She has young grandchildren around. She does not want to take the risk of the grandkids being uh, attacked by a, uh, an aggressive animal. And so certainly, um, you know, I feel like uh, the, the right decision was made by her to, uh, to get the animal off the farm. And I, I hope I made the right decision. I tried to do the right thing by uh, bringing the animal back here. We've got it quarantined. I'm trying to make sure that, uh, you know, I, anytime I go in there, I, I, um, uh, disinfect my boots and whatnot and try to practice good biosecurity but uh, the animal seems to be healthy the piglets seem to be healthy although there's a runt that I'm not quite sure it's going to make it uh, we'll see but uh, oh, anyhow that was a big part of my week this week was making that drive to pick up that pig and bring her home she's a pig that I absolutely love it's part of the reason why I was very very surprised when um this lady was uh, concerned about her exhibiting aggressive behavior because she has just always been a sweet, sweet pig where she loved belly rubs, she loved to see you, um, just, a, just a wonderful pig. One of the, uh, to be honest with you, uh, one of my favorite pigs ever. But I try to put that aside. I want to, I want to be careful that I don't give her too much uh, of the benefit of the doubt whereby that I'm keeping or breeding a an animal that is is aggressive and has those kinds of traits that I don't want to see. So as much as I love that pig, again, I'm, I'm trying to keep uh, an open mind here and evaluate her and then we'll see how things go. But now I have five baby piggies uh, that I just absolutely the cutest things. Uh, here on the farm and uh, so that's what's been going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead this week. I do hope that things on your homestead or where you are at have been going well and uh, that you are achieving an abundant harvest just as we are and uh, so anyhow that is this week's homestead happenings. Let's jump on over to this week's charting the course. <music> On today's episode, I want to talk about some of the things that we should be doing now to set us up for success with next year's garden. And honestly, I have not been the greatest at this. This is something that I'm really trying, this is a growing edge for me. It's something that I'm really trying to focus on this year. In fact, I'm using Google Keep Notes 
to jot down lessons that I'm learning, observations that I'm making, because I want next year's garden to be even better than this year's garden. And quite frankly, this year's garden has been good. But I'd like to make next year's garden even better. And so I am really trying to do a better job of keeping records and taking notes and, and keeping track of some of my observations. Now, some people are really, really great at journaling. And that's something that I've always wanted to do. I've just never been able to find that discipline. But I'm really finding that with Google Keep Notes that I'm able to type in those observations really quickly. And hopefully this is going to be something that is going to serve me well next year. Now, keep in mind, I am trying to do this for next year's summer garden. I'm trying to think ahead to next year's uh, summer garden, not to my fall garden. And the reason why I want to make that distinction there, it's not so much for, that I'm looking forward to next season, but next year's equivalent season. Because the lessons that I learn in spring may not translate to what I'm learning in summer, which may not translate to what I'm learning in the fall and so on and so forth. And it's, it's really quite simple in that the veggies that you grow in the spring are probably different than what you grow in the summer and the fall. The the light patterns are going to be different because there's leaves on the trees, the angle of the sun, the, the daylight that you get, the length of daylight, the weather patterns can be different from spring to summer to fall. Your pests are different. There's so much variation from season to season. And so I, I think you want to keep your notes based on the season in which you're making your observations. Now, again, this is something that's much easier said than done because at least for me, Sometimes I get so focused on the tasks at hand. You know, I've got to get the crops in the ground. I've got to, you know, keep the weeds out. I've Then it's on to harvesting and preserving. I get so, and maybe I want to do succession planning and maybe I want to do a fall garden or maybe I want to do whatever, whatever it is. I get so focused on all of those kinds of things that I neglect to note the things that have gone well or haven't gone well the lessons that I've learned so that, again, I can set myself up for greater success next year. And then sometimes what I found myself doing, because I, I didn't keep as good of notes as I should have, is I find myself repeating the same mistakes over and over again or maybe planting the wrong vegetable or the wrong variety because I didn't keep better track of what was going on in my garden during the season. And so today I wanna to just kind of run through 10 areas, maybe we'll call them, where I think we need to maybe make observations so that next year's garden is better than this year's garden. So number one, what varieties have done well this year or maybe have been historically a great producer for you and maybe which varieties haven't done so well? For me, this year, I have found, it just really jumped out at me, that the Zephyr Summer Squash has continued to produce when all of my other summer squashes and my zucchinis have died off. Now, I'm not sure what's killing them, but whatever it is that's killing them has taken everything out but the Zephyr Summer Squash. So why in the world, if that's done well for me, why in the world shouldn't I plant that again next year? Uh, I need to learn that lesson that is probably going to be my summer squash moving forward. It tastes great. I love it. it. It's very interesting because it's, you know, it's yellow at the top, got a little bit of green on the tip of it. Uh, it's a very pretty squash, very tasty squash, very happy with it. Let's learn that lesson. It does well for me. Uh, Jason Smith over at Cog Hill Farm, he talks about how uh, he has struggled to grow paste tomatoes. And he has really struggled to find a variety that does well for him. He's tried Romas and San Marzanos and Amish paste tomatoes. All tomatoes that have a great reputation with many, many gardeners. And they have not worked well for him. But he found this year that the Tachi works well for him. And so that is going to be his paste tomato moving forward. So what varieties do well? What varieties don't do well? You want to keep track of that so that next year... Uh, you can, again, plant what does work well and avoid what hasn't worked well for you. Now, keep in mind, just because a variety doesn't necessarily work one year doesn't mean that maybe you don't want to give it a second try. Sometimes it's just 
bad luck. <laughs> but if something, you know, you've tried it several times in, in a row and it just hasn't done well, then maybe it's time for you to move on to something else. So keeping track of what varieties do well and what varieties don't do well is key. The second area of observation is what varieties do you like? What varieties don't you like? Just because something is prolific, just because it does well in your area, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to like it. Last year, I planted a variety of tomato called the yellow plum. It was a prolific, a prolific bearer. I had yellow plum tomatoes out the wazoo. They were beautiful tomatoes. They were also tasteless tomatoes, at least to me. I did not like them. I did not plant them again this year because that's just not my preference. I, I didn't enjoy them. Over the last few years, I have planted a lot of different varieties of heirloom tomatoes. Last year, I think I tried four or five different uh, varieties of mortgage lifters, um, brandy wines, and I mean, I could just go down the list of, of tomatoes that I have tried. And the one that I have found that I like the most is the one that I didn't want to like the most, and that's the Rutgers tomato. The reason why I didn't want to like the Rutgers tomato is because it looks too much like a supermarket tomato. It doesn't have that wonderful knobbiness of an heirloom tomato, if you know what I'm talking about. But when it comes to taste, and when it comes to texture, and when it comes to how prolific it is, the Rutgers is my favorite heirloom tomato. So guess what? I'm going to stop monkeying around, not to say that I won't try a couple of other different heirloom tomatoes, but the bulk of my heirloom tomatoes are going to be Rutgers. I found an, a, a hybrid tomato this year through Jason uh, over at Coghill Farm, his recommendation called the Bella Rosa. Now, I have kind of in the past turned up my nose at hybrid tomatoes. Not anymore. The thing tastes great. It is prolific, and uh, so I prefer it. I'm going to grow it. Nothing wrong with that. The Amish Paste Tomato. I have found that I really, really like that. I have tried Romas and San Marzanos, and last year I did Bell Star Paste Tomatoes, but this was my second or maybe third year in a row of growing the Amish Paste Tomatoes, and I just love the size. I love the flavor. I love the texture of the Amish Paste Tomato. They work well for me. And so I've got that jotted down. Next year, I'm going to be growing Amish Paste Tomatoes, Rutgers, and Bella Rosas. I'm also going to throw in the pineapple just because I love the pineapple tomato. Uh, it, it's not been very prolific this year. I think I've gotten maybe one or two, um, but I'm still going to grow it because it's a pretty tomato. Um, but the bulk of my tomatoes are going to be those three, the Rutgers, the Bella Rosa, and the Amish Paste Tomato. So keep in mind what varieties you prefer what varieties you don't prefer. It's all personal preference, folks. There's no right or wrong answer. Just because so-and-so likes this tomato or so-and-so likes that tomato, you do what you like. You grow what you like. And that's what I'm trying to remind myself of the varieties that I prefer or that I don't prefer. It's all good. The third thing you might want to take a look at is are there things that you planted that you just don't eat? Or maybe you don't eat as much as you thought you would. You wish you would have planted less or you wish you wouldn't planted any at all. <laughs> so let me give you some examples from our garden this year. Number one is kale. I planted way too much kale. Up to this point, we have only had one meal with kale. My wife made some soup this week. It was a potato and sausage and kale soup and it was amazing. Woo! Oh my goodness, it was so good. It was good eating. But one meal, uh, or even if she made that once a month, it does not justify nine kale plants, I think is what I've got in there right now. I think I planted nine squares of collard greens. Now, remember, I use the square foot garden me method. We have not eaten one meal with collards. Now, this is the first year I've ever grown collards. It's not something that is very common up here in the north. I would have better off, been better off, planting one square foot of collards, then planting nine square feet of collards. The same thing with Swiss chard. 
I know that we don't eat a lot of Swiss chard. I plant it every year. It's a very, very beautiful. I, I plant the rainbow Swiss chard. It's very pretty in the garden. But nine squares of Swiss chard? Come on, Brian. What in the world were you thinking? <laughs> now, last year I learned a, a lesson with regards to radishes. I bought I bought a bunch of different varieties of radishes. I was excited to try them out. I can't remember how many different varieties, how many squares of radishes I planted. And then I remembered, I don't like radishes. I just don't like the bite of a radish. And so this year I did not plant any radishes whatsoever. And then I found out that you can cook radishes and that it takes some of the bite out of it. And then I was like, oh man, I wish I would have planted radishes so that I could at least try cooking some radishes. So I am gonna plant some radishes this fall. Uh, but it's not going to be 9 or 12 or whatever it was, 15 square feet of radishes. <laughs> All right, so uh, things that I don't eat or maybe I don't eat as much of them as, as, as I thought I would. And I want to keep that in mind because I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot of space that I can waste on things that I'm just not going to eat. Lettuce is another thing. Uh, sometimes I get carried away with it and I will plant, you know, 9 square feet of lettuce. There's just three of us in this house. And really, my son doesn't eat a lot of lettuce salads. So what in the world am I planting nine square feet of lettuce for? It's nuts. Come on, Brian. So i got to remember that. Don't plant as much lettuce as you have been. Do some succession planting. You know, plant some this week and plant some next week and plant some the week after that. And then when you pull the first lettuce, plant some more. But I don't need to plant nine square feet all at one whack. That's just crazy. So think about those kinds of things. Are there things that you've planted that you just don't eat? Or maybe you don't eat as much as you thought you would. The fourth thing that you might want to think about is, are there things that you wish you would have planted more of? So this year, I wish I would have planted more peppers, particularly jalapeno peppers and green peppers, but also some volcano and mariachis, which are a hybrid pepper, but I absolutely love them both. I wish I would have planted more onions. And that's kind of funny coming from a guy like me who in the past has not had great success growing onions. Now, not every variety of onion that I planted this year was successful, but I do wish I would have planted more onions. I wish I would have planted more herbs this year. I planted some, didn't harvest some as quickly as I should have, but I do wish I would have planted more herbs. And I wish I would have planted more summer squash. So those are some notes, some things that I want to keep in mind for next year some things that I might want to put in place of the kale and the collards and the Swiss chard and all of that lettuce that I've been growing. Maybe I'll throw in some more peppers, some more onions, some more herbs, and some more winter squash. The fifth area of observation actually, well, they're not even your observations. But are there observations that friends and fellow gardeners in your area have made that can be of help to you for next year's garden. Let me give you an example. A friend of mine, Rob, uh, is growing this year a variety of zucchini called Romanesco. And he said that they are going like gangbusters. Now, as I've shared with you before, I, I shared with you earlier today on this podcast, my zucchini uh, has been problematic. I will get zucchini and then all of a sudden something kills it off and then one day it's looking great and boom, the next day it's gone. And I'm not the only one in this area that has problems with that. I've talked to a number of different people and they are experiencing the same thing that I am with regards to zucchini. But Rob is telling me that this Romanesco variety of zucchini is just going like gangbusters for him. And so I'm gonna give it a whirl next year. And I'm gonna see if Romanesco zucchini is the magic bullet to all of my zucchini problems. <laughs> but lessons that we can learn from other people, observations that other people have made, friends, fellow gardeners, uh, are, are there things that you can take away from that that you can jot down that will be helpful to next year's garden? The sixth area of observation comes down to experiments. Now I think Every year you should experiment with something different in your garden, whether it's a different variety, a different methodology, a different uh, way of planting, a different timing. 
every year you should be trying something new. That's just my opinion, but I, I think that's how you get better at gardening. So are there experiments that have worked out well for you this year? Or are there experiments that didn't work out well for you? In my case, this year I tried a number of different things. First of all, I tried companion planting in my square foot gardens. I didn't care for it. Now maybe I chose the wrong companion plants. That may have been it. But what I found is that I had issues where the plant that was the companion crowded out the other plant. For example, I think I planted some beans next to carrots. I think they were supposed to be good companions. And what happened is the beans grew up too tall and kind of crowded out the carrots. You may also recall that I am experimenting with the Ruth Stout method. Now, the Ruth Stout method in some regards worked well with potatoes and tomatoes and things like that. It seemed to work well. Things that I planted from seed didn't seem to work out quite well. And certainly the square foot gardening spacing that I tried in the roost out method just was not, it was not a success at all. So I learned some things there on how to plant the roost out bed, what to plant there, uh, and hopefully I will remember those things. I've jotted those notes down and hopefully next year when it comes time to do the roost out gardening, I will have remembered those things, those experiments that worked well and the ones that didn't work well, and that way we'll hopefully have greater success in the Roost Out Garden next year. What are you experimenting with this year? Make sure you keep good notes, or even maybe not so good notes, but at least some kind of notes, <laughs> so that next year you can build on what you've experimented with or avoid giving those experiments another try. The seventh area of observation is, are there things that you've learned about your land or about how your garden is laid out? Is one area more shaded than you thought or one area maybe not quite as shaded as you thought? Is there an area that maybe doesn't drain well or an area that has a tendency to dry out? Keeping some notes on those things certainly can be very, very helpful when planning next year's garden. The next thing you might want to think about is pests. <laughs> you probably don't want to think about pests, to be honest with you, but you really probably should be noting down any pest pressure that you've been dealing with. Uh, are there bugs that you've been dealing with, or are there maybe four-legged creatures that you need to account for? This year, in our raised bed garden, we had a lot more deer problem than I've ever had, and so I came up with kind of this electric fence that's not electrified. <laughs> what it is is a row of T-posts that has a strand of poly wire at 18, 36, and 54 inches. And then coming out off of that, there's another run of poly wire that's at about 18 inches. And supposedly what that's supposed to do is kind of create a 3D effect and the deer can't figure out how to get over it and so they go find somebody else's garden to munch. That's at least the theory and it seems like it's worked out well for me. However, that's a temporary solution for me. I don't like how it looks. It's a pain in the butt to try to mow around and so I've got to come up with a better solution next year. I need to keep in mind that I'm dealing with deer and uh, so I've got to do something about that. So are there pests that you've needed to deal with uh, this year and how are you going to deal with them next year? It could be bugs, squash bugs, cucumber beetles, um, whatever it is, horn, tomato hornworms. But what is going to be your plan of attack next year to deal with those pests based on what you've learned this year? And along with that, are there any diseases that popped up this year that you need to think about? So maybe you're experiencing some kind of a blight. You need to make sure that you get all of that material out of your garden area and you burn it and get rid of it. Or maybe you need to think about doing some crop rotation next year because you want to make sure that you are not planting the same crop in the same area where you had a disease problem. So you definitely want to keep in mind, keep track of, think about any diseases that you've been dealing with this year so that next year you have a plan of attack and you're able to handle that.
Finally, did your vegetables start producing at the quote unquote wrong time? <laughs> One year, my green beans came on the week of the county fair. And so what I found is I would be going to the fair, then I'd be coming back home, and then I would be picking beans and snapping beans, and I would be up until 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning uh, canning beans, and then I would be going to work and then back to the fair, and it just made for an absolutely tiring week because my vegetables were producing at the wrong time. So if you have things like a fair or you have things like a standard family vacation that you do during the summer, you need to keep in mind when your vegetables at least might start to produce. Keep in mind that what's on the back of the seed packet is a suggestion. <laughs> Things don't always go according to plan, and I get that. But is there a way that you can adjust when you plant or when you plan your activities so that your vegetables aren't producing at the quote-unquote wrong time? So those are my suggested observations. Obviously, I, I doubt this is a comprehensive list by any stretch of the imagination. And so if there are some observations that you have made, some lessons that you've learned that aren't on my list, I'd love to hear from you. Brian at thehomesteadjourney.net is my email address. And of course, you can reach out to us on Facebook and Instagram as well. All right, everyone, that is it for this week's episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. You found it helpful. If you have any questions or comments, I'd definitely be glad to hear from you. And I try to respond to every email that I get, every message that I get through our social media. Definitely would be glad to, uh, to have a conversation with you. If you'd like to support the show, there's a number of things that you can do. First of all, the easiest thing is to give us a thumbs up, a like, a review, on your favorite podcast player, that will help other people find the show. Secondly, share the show with other people that you think might be uh, might, might find it beneficial. And then finally, we do have a shop set up on our website, thehomesteadjourney.net slash shop. Those are affiliate links to uh, Amazon. And so if you buy any of those products, they're all products that we use here on our homestead that we recommend. It's not just junk that I've put up there, but if I like it and I use it, then it's up there uh, as a link. And uh, I would definitely um, appreciate it if you, uh, you bought some of that stuff. <laughs> if you find it helpful. Now, don't buy it just to buy it. But uh, if you're in the market for some of that stuff and you do buy it through that page, we do receive a bit of a commission for it. And that just helps me uh, pay the bills. Um, the hosting fees and so forth that come along with doing a podcast. The music on this podcast, as always, is provided by audionautics.com. So a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work. <laughs>